So I had to do my interview with Dr. Bornavinsky and we had talked about pulmonary hypertension. A few questions that I had asked him, first of all, was tell me a little bit about pulmonary hypertension and his response was pulmonary hypertension is defined as an increased pulmonary artery pressure to exceed 35 millimeters per mercury. The best way to diagnose this was with right heart catheteriz catheterization, which will identify if the systolic pulmonary pressure exceeds that 35 millimeters mercury. I had also asked him why he used 35 when the ASC defines pulmonary hypertension as anything to exceed 25 millimeters per mercury. And he said, if that was the case, if that's what he would do, then more than half of his patients would have pulmonary hypertension and then they would be given unnecessary medications. So he liked the number 35. And while I was talking to him, he actually brought up the facts or he gave me something to look into whether the 25 that the ASE had talked about was either the mean or the systolic arterial pressure. And I wasn't able to tell him at the time. And honestly, I'm not able to tell you right now. I'm in Florida, so I'm not trying to look it up. But let's see. What signs and symptoms would a patient with pulmonary hypertension show? He said that a patient with pulmonary hypertension would present with shortness of breath, lower extremity edema, fatigue, right-sided heart, heart failure, which can, which can lead to the body developing fluid in the abdomen. And this is gonna occur because the pressure, the, in, because of the increased venous pressure in the IVC, after a while that would back up back up you know to too much I guess and it would just start seeping through the veins if this occurs then we gotta check out the hepatic veins to make sure that the pressures in them are not too far and we we would also have to you know rule out a possible infection the next question I asked was what are the possible causes for pulmonary hypertension and there are five groups the first one being pulmonary arterial pressure, hypertension, excuse me. This one is idiopathic, but the most common. It can also be because of left-sided heart failure, COPD, or a thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is caused by pulmonary emboli. If the patient presents with, uh, you know, possible pulmonary emboli, you got to give them blood thinners. That's how he would treat them. And the reason why they have five different groups is because there's five different ways to treat each, you know, specific type. What tests, I asked him what tests he would order, and he said that the right heart catheterization is the gold standard. Typically, what they would do is they would administer a vasodilator to make the catheterization process a little bit easier. A VQ scan would be ordered if the patient suspected of having thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, he also backtracked a little bit about to tell me about right heart catheterization. Let me see what I got down here. He said that during an echo, if we can't get a proper TR gradient, then we would be doing right heart catheterization just to make sure either way. I had asked him also if this was more common in men or women, women, and he pretty much said he doesn't know. He doesn't think that it's relevant to any, you know, practice. It's not, it doesn't happen because of somebody's gender, I guess. There's not really anything there. He did mention that, you know, in America, a very common cause for pul pulmonary hypertension is sleep apnea. Apnea, I guess the lack of breathing every once in a while can make it tough. If not treated, can this be fatal? Yes, it can be fatal because the, you know, after a while, the right heart will fail. And you know, you can't really live with half a heart. 
Can a patient with pulmonary hypertension have a regular life? Yes, with modern medicine, as long as the patient see seeks medical help in an appropriate time, they'll be able to have their life return to normal. That was my last question over there, but after I had shut off my recording, he wanted to bring up the fact that if a patient has had a myocardial infarction or just really any portion of the heart that is not moving properly, you have to take that in consideration with the cardiac output because if the cardiac output is low, then the TR gradients that we get aren't gonna be accurate. And in that case, then we would have to do the right heart catheterization to get an accurate estimate, estimation. And I did wanna say that doing this interview with the cardiologist was a great experience. I'm really glad that I did it. I'm glad that he had time to do it with me. Something I think I'll remember for a long time.